let me introduce you to Mr. Luke Jennings. He is the Chief Research Officer for Countercept, going to be talking to you about memory resident implants. Take it away, Luke. Okay, hey everyone. Um, just to give you a very brief background before we move on, um, I'm approaching this from the perspective of both sort of offense and defense. So with my background, I was very much on the red team side. So memory resident uh, implants were a big part of that. And then I've kind of switched over to the blue team side in more recent years and looked at how to sort of detect them. So we're gonna kind of consider it from, um, from both angles and uh, there. So just to um, clear one thing up in case uh, anyone is confused over what this might be. I'm, when I say uh, code injection, I'm not talking about sort of exploits here, buffer flows, that kind of thing. I'm, I'm not talking about anything that involves crossing a privilege boundary. I'm purely talking about um, essentially hosting your, your malicious code, your implant in another process or doing any sort of form of dynamic code execution there that's kind of keeping things off of disk. Um, so we're considering that kind of angles, not this. So it's very much more these kind of things. So cross-process access mechanisms for injecting native code or like sort of dynamic execution methods that can be used within frameworks like PowerShell.net. And we'll come to a bit more detail of those different things as we move on. So um, first of all, um, what does this look like uh, if you go back some time? What's the sort of classic ways people are doing this? So um, a common approach is reflective DLL loading. Um, this is something that frameworks like Metasploit have been using for um, many years, dating back you know, over a decade uh, with something like uh, the Meterpreter. And you kind of got classic access patterns here of where you, know, you want to migrate your implant from a process that you're currently in into another le legitimate um, process to hide it. Um, and you'll use API calls like virtual arc and write process memory and then create a remote thread. So essentially you have something that looks like this. Uh, you have got a, a process where you've got image locations mapped for sort of if this was calc, you might have calc.exe and then all the DLLs mapped. Um, so you virtual arc some space that will be a private uh, the allocated region. You might make that read, write, execute, for example, um, write your malicious code into it and then create a new thread that runs that. And then you've got a legitimate process that's still operating as you expect, um, but you've also put your malicious implant into it. Um, and so then you can effectively write your implants as, as DLLs, but then you won't have to load them from disk. You can actually do it all in memory. And a lot of the idea behind that originally was kind of to be anti-forensics, to keep things off of disk, because a lot of um, traditional forensics was based on sort of disk forensics. Um, another classic technique would be um, process hollowing, this is kind of similar, but rather than, often rather than run a DLL, it's maybe running an actual executable, but making it appear to be a legitimate executable. So generally here, you would use a few different types of APIs that were slightly different, but you would have, you know, if, it, if calc was your hosting process here, you would unmap the main part. So you create a process in a suspended state, so nothing's running, um, and you process, then you unmap the original XE, you reallocate memory in its place, you put your malicious code in there, um, you may then change the properties of where the thread is gonna run from with set thread context, and then you resume and effectively, um, you've got something that's then running uh, your code instead of what was supposed to be calc, but from the OS's perspective, it kind of looks like calc could run. Uh, so that's two very common sort of classic techniques for doing these kind of things. Um, and they've been around for years, people have been using them. And, and, and when I first moved over to the um, sort of blue team side, uh, one of the questions you know, I had was, what, why is it that when we operate as a red team, people can't, um, can't detect us, can't pick us up easily? Why do we have it so easy, at, at least at the time, how, we, uh, how things have been? Um, and these were sort of two of the kind of things I was thinking. I was like, we've got to be able to detect memory resident implants, because it seems to be people aren't very good at that, or at least weren't at the time a few years ago. Um, so what are the approaches you can take for, for detection here? Well, there's a couple of different angles you can take, and I'm going to start with the tracing angle. So here we're talking about sort of real-time techniques, so by tracing instruments in different um, data providers that you can actually get a real-time view of what's going on in the operating system, and as such, understand when these sort of techniques might be in use. So what are your options here? Um, I mean, you know, one thing is you could do sort of hooking in the kernel. Obviously, that's something that's been a no-go area for a long time now, ever since sort of 64 bit and patch guard and, and so forth. If you were trying to do that in a production way, it's obviously not something that's um, that's permitted, and it's not uh, it's not a really viable approach. Um, but it would have been in the in the past. Um, then a lot of people instead will have moved to user land hooking. Now, again, 
you know, for any form of hooking, it's not the greatest for stability, but you can at least do it in the user land if you want to. But it's also possible to bypass. So like if, if, um, if you've got malicious code and it's expecting that it might be inspected by user, user land hooks, you can either sort of detect and unhook those things, or you can make direct syscalls without actually going via the libraries that are being hooked. So there's, you know, there's a few approaches there. It's something that is circumventable by malicious code. Um, or you can take officially provided information from the OS, which is obviously the most safe way to do it. And um, traditionally, this has been mostly sort of kernel callbacks, so you can get sort of notifications on new process and thread creation events that can be used to sort of analyze some of this. And then you've got callbacks you can get for handle operations. So you can see, oh, okay, you know, process A opened a handle to process B or opened a handle to a certain thread. And you can get some level of information about um, what's going on by looking at those. And also with the event tracing framework, ETW, there's providers um, related to the kernel that give you some information um, similar to this as well. So information from about thread start events and you know, virtual allux and, and those kind of things. So the, they're your main sort of routes for getting telemetry related to this uh, traditionally when it comes to the tracing side. So uh, an example of this practically is, is Microsoft Sysmon. So um, there are examples there for um, some event IDs that Sysmon can generate that are related to these areas. So there's a couple of examples there. We've got a process access event and we've got um, a create remote thread event. Um, so if we thought about that classic example of D uh, DLL, their uh, reflective DLL loading from before, then we would see events triggered here. So we'd see, okay, process A access process B, and then it used create remote thread and actually fired off a new thread inside it. And using that, we might be able to see some of these techniques as they happen in real time. Um, so a lot of people, I think, in this area have generally focused on finding quite specific sets of API calls, how they are called and with what options as, uh, as being methods for actually detecting this. So they might say, OK, well, I expect to see virtual alloc called. I expect the, I expect the permissions to be read, write, execute, then write process memory, then create remote thread in the same region, and making quite specific detection routines around that. Um, Obviously, with anything of security, it becomes you know, a bit of a cat and mouse game, an arms race, and um, people using these techniques are then trying to find ways of doing it in slightly different ways so that it doesn't trigger a detection mechanism. Um, so from that perspective, in terms of like, how these things have evolved, I think it's quite good to think of things in terms of what are the key primitives that you, you kind of need to achieve to, to, to get the end goal. And generally speaking, um, that's either, you know, first of all, you need to get some sort of code into another process. Um, and then you need to be able to redirect the execution flow somehow. And so those previous techniques we've looked at, they achieve both of those goals. But the point is, there's multiple different ways that those goals can be achieved. And if you can find different ways of stitching bits of code together that, that meets those, uh, that criteria, then you can probably do the same thing. And if someone's got a quite a specific detection mechanism in place, uh, that relies on the existing technique and you've just found another way of doing it, then you may be able to bypass this solution. So there's more examples than this, but on the slides you can see you know, some examples of writing code into another process is obviously your classic you know, write process memory. Um, but you can also map sections into another process. Um, there's atom bombing, we'll come to that later, but that was another way someone found of doing this in a quite interesting way. You can find pre-existing shared sections um, in a target process and then map them yourself. Um, you know, there's, there's multiple different ways. And then on the execution flow side, you've generally got um, sort of, most of them are the classic ones that would be uh, thread manipulation methods. So create remote thread as an example, but also queue in APCs or using set thread context to change the execution context of an existing thread. And in those ways, you manipulate um, an existing thread of execution, and you can, you can do, achieve that that way. But there's a couple of other things. There's the NT close trick. We'll come to that later. Um, and there's a, a few other things. That we, uh, set windows long, for example, is a way of manipulating pointers um, in another process and then sending a message to that process that calls those, causes those pointers to be called. Um, so essentially, the point here is if you can figure out a, a way of achieving both those things, then you might find ways of circumventing detection methods in place. So as an example of this, one of the newer techniques we've seen is atom bombing. Um, so the idea here is you, you try and make it appear like there isn't necessarily the traditional uh, writing going on to another process. So you avoid the ways that people have normally been instrumenting this, uh, and you just do the execution flow part. So 
the way this works is it makes use of the, the, the atom table, which is shared between processes, and your, your sort of first process that's doing the injection will actually put data into the atom table. And then it makes use of APCs to um, fire APCs against the other process and get it to uh, call the, f the functions required to actually get the atom and write it into a pre-existing bit of memory that, that's been located in that process. And then eventually, um, so essentially you get something that looks a little bit like this, you fire the APC, that uh, function primitive is, is called, it gets the value of the atom, it writes it to a pre-existing code cave, that co cave at the time will not be executable yet. Um, once it's built up the shell code in the other process by using enough APCs, um, it will then do one more APC that will execute uh, a ROP chain, so return oriented programming, to basically uh, reallocate a new section of memory locally with read write execute permissions and copy that shell code to it and execute it. So then it's principally using APCs and avoiding the sort of write process memory method or avoiding the um, you know mapping a section and some of the other ways that people are generally an analyzing it but still getting code into the other process um, and achieving those primitives. Uh, this is something that was, uh, you know, has been adopted by some malware families. I think Drydex, for example, I think started making use of this at some point. Um, but it's a really, really interesting technique. I think it was maybe sometime last year that it, it, that it was published. Um, but this is an example of the evolution of this, this kind of uh, approach. So, interestingly, if you consider atom bombing with something like Sysmon, um, you can still gain some visibility of it. Now, it might not be that it's necessarily easy to detect in practice, but you can see, for example, Sysmon gives you a, a process access event if you use the proof of concept code that's available publicly. Um, so, essentially, the proof of concept code still calls open process, uh, such you've got that visibility. Now, you don't know necessarily that other things have happened. There's no create remote thread because it's using APC, so you don't have that event, but you can at least see there was some kind of interaction between those two processes. And if, if in practice you're able to determine that's malicious, then that's a way of seeing it. Um, but actually with this technique, the proof of concept code uses open process to make certain aspects of it easier, but it's not strictly required. Really, you can get away with just using open thread and opening handles to the threads in the target process, which is required to execute APCs against them. Um, and then you can avoid generating that process access event. So it's actually possible to, to actually get around the telemetry of, of, of Sysmon by doing this. So if you see, it's probably a little bit difficult to see in this video, but I'm popping out from Chrome via the original proof, proof of concept code, and you can see a process access event will have been generated. Um, if we take a slightly modified approach, we can still reliably um, inject our code. I'm popping calc again there, just as an example. Um, but if we look then, we, there's no second process access event. So we can actually get around the telemetry by taking that approach. Um, now, there are kernel callbacks for thread, open thread events. You can get callbacks for opening a handle to a thread. Um, it's not something that's present in, in Sysmon currently, as far as I'm aware. But um, So there are at least technical ways that you could gain some more visibility here. But um, essentially, one of the main issues is that for the OS pre-Windows 10, Really, a lot of these techniques, it was just hard to get the exact data you wanted without, um, without hooking. So if you think about it, getting a callback on a handle, yes, you can see a handle was open to another process or another thread, but then you're having to kind of infer what that might mean. There's lots of reasons that that could be done legitimately. You can't necessarily see that someone used that to write process memory or queue an APC or something like that, you can maybe try to infer from the permissions they requested that they would have been able to, to do it. But then, you know, lots of times you'll find that in legitimate things, people just do process all access or thread all access. And so the common scenario is that when you see it, it would have been permissible. Um, but actually, Windows 10 has obviously introduced a lot more tracing mechanisms for this sort of thing. So if you consider something like atom bombing with uh, Microsoft ATP, now, uh, on a Windows 10 machine, you know, there's actually direct detections for it, and there's blogs from, um, you know, out there about this. Um, and there's actually better instrumentation, so you get more direct visibility of some of the, uh, the calls related to this, um, which is great. But if we look at another technique, um, another one that came along now, I found this referred to as the NT closed trick somewhere, but um, essentially, this tries to avoid, rather than uh, avoid the actual code writing process that atom bombing is doing, it's avoiding doing the traditional execution flow 
um, calls. So it avoids any sort of thread manipulation events. So in this case, really this is quite a specific Im implementation of a wider issue. But the idea is that you hook something that's going to be frequently called, and so you indirectly gain control of a thread when it next executes that code, rather than using create remote thread or queuing APC or changing an existing thread. So you avoid that, the telemetry that someone might have for those um, functions and, and hijack the execution in a different way. So you write your code somewhere, then NT close is just something that happens to be frequently called. So it's just an example of something you could hook. You could hook anything, really. Um, so you allocate your code here, you put your malicious code in present, then you do a standard inline hook on NT-close, you change the permissions, you put a jump in there, for example, jumps off to your code. Um, then at some point uh, in the near future, an existing thread's gonna come along, try and call NT-close, and then get redirected off to your code. So in that way, you gain um, your cross-process code execution uh, by avoiding the thread manipulation functions and just doing the code writing. So if someone's relying on generating an alert from seeing you know, one of those thread control things, like seeing APCs getting queued up, um, then they're going to miss it. So for example, I, did, I was able to try this on ATP very recently. Um, this, there's a, a few different alerts that can come up in ATP related to code injection. Um, this, at least with the method that I tested for doing it, did not generate an active alert on ATP. Um, but the first way I did it at least generated some telemetry. So using the advanced hunting interface, you can see that there was evidence that it occurred. So you get this sort of um, allocating uh, virtual memory call log here. So I was injecting into Notepad in this case, and I was able to track that down. But interestingly, that seemed to be related to the fact that I was allocating memory read, write, execute. Um, when I did it where I allocated read, write first, then changed the permissions to read, execute afterwards, the telemetry for that seemed to go. So I wasn't aware of that before, um, but that meant that actually executing that way means there's then no telemetry to even look back on. So this is another sort of example of how, you know, changing the way we do use these APIs to achieve the same can uh, can get around certain different types of logging mechanisms for this. So I want to consider a different angle now. Um, I've obviously gone over a, a bunch of different topics fairly quickly there, but I've been focusing on two key things, which is cross-process access. So we're moving code between processes. Um, and I've also been focusing on tracing examples. So from a from a real world perspective here, it's sort of assuming, okay, someone's got some awesome EDR in, in place already. Um, but there's a couple of other considerations here. One is that sometimes processes might load this within their own process. There may be no cross-process mechanism. It's still an interesting thing to be able to see if a process starts strangely dynamically loading code. Um, that's something you might want to be able to see, and it's something we commonly see attack frameworks do as well. Um, and the other aspect is just, you know, what happens if someone gets compromised and they don't already have great EDR in place, um, which is a common scenario for us because we, for our clients, like we, we proactively protect clients where we're providing monitoring 24-7, but we also have lots of people that come to us having had an incident and said, you know, we need help. Um, and in many cases, they won't have any EDR. Uh, so we need to be able to find pre-existing memory resident implants at that point. Um, so there is a different way of looking at this, um, and that's, that's important as well. So um, the key technique I'm con we normally use for this and I consider is, is memory analysis or memory forensics. Um, there's a few advantages and disadvantages to this before we go into detail about it. I mean, I've obviously been, been over one already. The, the, the ability to find a pre-existing implant is great. Um, so that's something that's really beneficial for this. Um, the other interesting part of it is that we're essentially looking for the end result. So that gives us two advantages. One, it means it doesn't matter whether the code injection was done cross-process or within a process, because um, we're looking at the end result, like it's going to look the same thing. And that also means it's immune to this idea of like API evasion. You know, because if you think, if we've got process A and we've got something and we want to put something in process B, with the techniques we were looking at before, we're finding clever different routes to get there, but the end result's always the same. So 
um, if you take a memory analysis example, it, those, finding different ways of achieving the same end goal doesn't matter. We still, we still see the end result. So that's an advantage too. Um, but obviously, the cons side, like that's a bit different. So one, OK, it's not real time. So we won't see short-lived things. It can be quite performance intensive. Um, so that's another consideration. And um, the other aspect is we can't as easily see the source of something. So if, it, if we're talking about a cross-process example, with tracing, we can say, oh, this thing happened to process B, and it was this process A over here that, that did it. And whereas with memory analysis, we'd be saying, oh, there's something weird in, in process B. We need to look at this. But we don't necessarily know without further investigation what was responsible for that in the first place. Now, a lot of people that would be thinking of memory forensics here would probably be thinking about volatility, which is pretty much the de facto standard uh, tool for performing memory forensics. And it's a brilliant open source tool. Um, the problem with it is, is that this is a sort of single system at a time thing. We've got to take a memory dump from a system and, and analyze it offline, which is great for IR when we've got a system that we already know is compromised. It's not as good when we need to proactively search across the whole estate. Um, but you can take similar approaches to doing this across the scale. It's something we do and we'll, we'll look at uh, going forwards. So what are we looking for here? Um, essentially, um, we're looking for, as I said before, we, I kept saying we're, we're looking for the end result. We're, we're looking for strange code living in memory that doesn't reflect what we would normally see for a native app running. So for a normal native app running, we would see mem image locations. We would see file backed sections linking back to the right executables or DLLs. Um, that's, and we'd have sections fully loaded, the correct memory permissions that we would normally expect, and so forth. Um, but if we see something like Meterpreter's example, it will read, write, execute, allocate the whole thing. Um, there won't be proper sections. There won't be different memory permissions. Uh, it will be privately allocated memory. So we can enumerate different memory regions and look for those strange things. Um, and that's a common sort of generic approach for looking for this. Um, so you can see the Meterpreter example there. I mean, I don't want to fo focus only on public tools, though. So um, if we consider another example, one of the things we did is we did quite a look into uh, into the double pulsar stuff that came out um, last year. Um, so for this, this was a kernel mode payload that was used to inject DLLs into user mode processes. Now, the kernel aspect of it for the techniques we, we were using ourselves currently, we wouldn't have seen and was a very advanced payload. But the end result was that it would effectively allocate a DLL into another user mode process. And the same kind of approaches then uh, worked for us there. So. It like, looks slightly different to the, the interpreter example. It's actually properly allocated to sections. But um, effectively, we still got something that's in a privately allocated region uh, and stands out as being something that shouldn't be there. So we can still f find the end result of that being used with these kinds of techniques. So as a kind of quick example, this is something from one of our systems of looking at this when we've got these techniques sort of running across scale. This was, I think, something on, uh, on, on our network testing out with Meterpreter. We end up finding um, evidence of this where we can see uh, an, uh, what looks like a reflective load that's occurred on a system. Uh, we can see that it, this has occurred in, only on one system. Um, this was the result of, uh, I think, a, a Meterpreter session that generated a, a randomly named executable and then had loaded the DLLs within that. And we can kind of see the permissions associated with it, the process, and so forth. And this then stands out as being something that's of interest for following up. And at this point, we would obviously go and get a real process dump and analyze it further. Um, so that, th that aspect is, is, is looking for uh, evidence of code. That's one, one aspect of this. Another one we can look at is look at threads and say, well, you know, a code needs threads to run. Um, so we can have a look at, uh, you know, are there any threads that are, that are executing code in strange locations too? So this is something we've done for a while, and there's also uh, there's also an open source um, PowerShell script out there for testing this out too. But essentially, you know, if we, we considered that original classic DLL injection technique from the beginning, we've got one thread of execution dedicated to running our malicious code, and that is running in a strange area of memory. So if we look at the start addresses of all the threads in a process, and we correlate that with everything else we know about the memory space, we can find things that look strange. So in this case, 
um, you know, this was being run in the same kind of example. We've injected into Notepad, and this script has identified that there is a strange thread there. So that's another approach we can take to this, which is pretty interesting. Um, and those techniques, those two techniques alone, have have um, been really useful for us in, in practice in finding real-world compromises. So they they are pretty pretty useful uh, as a different angle. So um, it's not just offensive tool sets that, that use these. There are a couple of, uh, I'm just going to give a couple of examples to show that this is something that's, that's actually affecting real world, um, uh, real world organizations. I mean, for a start, okay, the, the double pulsar issue um, was obviously being used by groups long bef before it was uh, made public, but then that got turned into WannaCry. So, um, WannaCry effectively really used the Eternal Blue exploit, which made use of the double pulsar implant and used it to deliver ransom, uh, ransomware. Um, it bypassed a lot of different ransomware protection mechanisms that people had in place or products and so forth. Um, and it's something that we actually saw. We, we had customers that were affected by this and these techniques then um, sort of were able to show that uh, WannaCry had been infecting certain networks. Um, so that's one example from a sort of malware outbreak scenario. Um, but we've also seen it in more sort of targeted attacks. We've, we've seen actual real world attackers, interestingly enough, using Metasploit before. We've seen in the energy sector uh, an example of things like targeted IP theft. And the way we were able to pick out is using these exact techniques, deploy into the already compromised network, discovering um, interpreter set, uh, implants in different processes in memory already, um, and finding it that way. We've also seen things like, uh, so Turler is a, a very advanced um, sort of malware framework. Um, it's got a very advanced kernel rootkit, but that is then similar to Double Pulsar, also often used as a staging mechanism to put things into user land. So, you know, we've gone into real world targeted attack scenarios there where we've then seen evidence of the DLLs injected into key window services and so forth using the same techniques. So these are things that real world attackers are using. It's not just pen testers and red teamers. Um, it's something we see all the time. And these techniques have been very useful to us in, in the past. But obviously with anything on these lines, like attackers respond, right? And as there's been more information about this kind of going into the public domain and some of these sort of techniques are being discussed more, um, we started seeing a response from the security community on this. So you can just see a few examples here. Like, I mean, there's blog posts about evading the, the PowerShell script I showed you before. Um, there is uh, sort of things like Cobalt Strike, which is an offensive tool set. They've got options for sort of obfuscating parts of what they're doing in memory to make it more difficult to pick up um, evidence of this with these techniques. And we've then got um, techniques like Gargle, which is a, is a dedicated technique for evading memory analysis. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail in a sec. Um, actually, our own red teamers at MWR have, um, have, have blogged in the past, for example, about integrating techniques like Gargle into, um, into offensive frameworks like Cobalt Strike. So there's you know, a lot of stuff that's moving here in terms of actually um, making these, these, uh, these methods harder to use. So what are the common bypass approaches here? So I think you know, there's a lot of ways you could approach this as an attacker. Um, I would say, broadly speaking, it's three categories uh, that I see most commonly. One is obfuscation. So we can look for anything that looks like code, but actually you'll find in the real world that's pretty difficult in terms of the noise threshold. There's actually quite a lot of examples of things that are executable but don't necessarily line up with what you might expect when you look at a process that fall outside of the normal image locations. In particular, things like um, anything that's just in time compiled. So in browsers with like JavaScript engines or .NET or Java, you know, all these sorts of things are dynamically um, creating and well, compiling native code in the process. So that, that can provide challenges. But if someone is um, wanting to make use of um, sort of fully featured implants, they'll probably have uh, written them in a higher level language like C or something and compile them to a DLL so you can be a little bit better when you actually start looking for evidence of full DLLs. So some of the approaches are to obfuscate that, to make it hard to identify that something is actually a DLL and, and making it more difficult that way. Uh, that can be simple things like wiping the headers um, or it can be you know, more advanced things of, uh, of obfuscating other parts of the executable code itself. 
Um, the other thing is what I'd say is probably hide in plain sight. So for a start, for things like threads, you know, if you avoid actually starting threads in mem private regions, you try and focus on making use of pre-existing threads and rerouting them, it becomes harder to see that that's happened um, other than correlating where they started. And when you look at where they started, they started from legitimate locations in the first place. So that's one approach people take. Um, the other, the other approach is to actually overwrite legitimately loaded DLLs. So then, you know, a lot of these techniques people have been looking at before are focused on looking at um, privately allocated regions only or maps regions, but not looking at image locations. Um, but if you actually sort, sort of, for example, load a legit, perfectly legitimate DLL into a process that's not actually required, but um, is a, you know, is a known nice Microsoft signed DLL, for example, then you can load that and then you can change your permissions and overwrite it with your code and then start running stuff. And then it's harder to identify with these techniques that that is uh, necessarily malicious. In fact, it becomes um, very difficult to identify, in principle, that kind of approach with memory analysis alone, because then you need to know that what is there is not, uh, does not reflect what, it's, what is on disk. So actually, you need hybrid approaches there that can take things and, and sort of compare what's on disk with what's in memory and determine whether that looks like it's correct or not. And the other approach, which is Gargo, is, is to not be code at all. So Gargo is based on ensuring that it's marked to be non-executable most of the time and making use of uh, timers and rock chains to change its permissions and execute and then uh, put things back to read only. And then the idea is that for something like memory analysis, that unless you catch it while it was actively doing something, which you'd have to be very lucky to if it's just an implant that calls back once a minute or once an hour or whatever the case is, um, it's going to be very hard for you to identify because then you've got to find something that looks like code that shouldn't be there that isn't even marked as code. And you know, that's the, the idea behind that as an approach. So for one, one aspect here is, so I mentioned image overwriting, and this is where you need a hybrid sort of technique. It's much harder with memory analysis alone. You can take a, a mapped um, DLL uh, that's in an image location and say, um, OK, all right, it's on disk. Let's go and look at it. Let's take it, let's emulate the loading process, say it should be laid, loaded at this base address, let's apply all the relocations and then end up with something and say, okay, this is what I think it should look like in memory. And then you can compare that to what's actually there. So we take some, sort of some approaches like that and you can sort of then see, okay, well, the permissions have changed, the entry point's been modified and it's only a 3% match byte for byte with what I expected to be there, that's suspicious. In this case here, we're looking at that with, um, uh, with one of the results at the top, the calc, um, and that's an example of, of using um, this sort of technique. Um, but you will find lots of examples where there are legitimate differences. So there's a few examples there that you can see are very close matches. It's normally because of legitimate inline hooking that's in place. So you'll find, you know, maybe there's a few bytes changed where certain functions have had inline hooks installed by security products or, or whatever they may be. Um, but you can clearly see a big difference when it's, you know, a 3% match versus a 99% match or whatever. Um, so that's, that's sort of one approach to doing that. Um, Gargo is, uh, is pretty difficult. Um, so the problem with Gargo is that the, the information around the timers it uses, so it makes use of set weightable timer, that creates um, something that's eventually in the kernel and that will fire APCs to, to execute it. Now, the difficulty there is that that information is like in un undocumented structures in the kernel. It's kind of, if you wanted to do that in production, in an endpoint agent, for example, it's a little bit unsafe to be considering going and reading areas of memory there. So it's not ideal from that perspective. So from a, from a telemetry perspective, it's kind of hard to, to get information about those timers. Um, but if you're doing it with something like volatility and doing offline memory forensics, you don't have to worry about reliability or safety then. Um, so actually, uh, at least in this case, quite recently, I think it was last week, we, we put out a blog on this, but we wrote a, a, a volatility plugin for this so you can actually enumerate uh, the timers on the system, identify the completion routines associated with them, and then see if they look strange. And, and effectively, by strange here, we're saying, okay, it looks like it points to a ROP gadget that's used to um, mark the code. Uh, mark a section of code as executable, then jump to it, um, and differentiate that from what we'd expect as being normal legitimate uses of completion routines for set weightable timer. Um, so you can, you know, you can detect it that way. But doing it uh, on, a, on a, you know, in a production grade sense is is a bit harder without having a reliable way of accessing that telemetry. 
So I focused completely on native stuff so far, um, but I'm going to quickly go over a little bit, uh, moving on to looking at other frameworks here. So first of all, I think a few years ago when PowerShell became big, there was um, quite a lot of offensive work done in that space. So I think it was initially one of those things where at least I think in the offensive security community, people were initially resistant uh, probably to PowerShell and were like, you know, I, everything we do in terms of using things, we're using Linux and Bash and so forth. But then, you know, then they realized that actually it's really useful for offensive operations and then everyone loved it and everyone started developing PowerShell exploitation frameworks and so forth. And then that became a very commonly used technique and we see it in the wild all the time. Um, but obviously the blue team came along. Um, there's been lots of great work done here at Microsoft in terms of improving the um, login features in PowerShell, for example, and, uh, and in the AMSI interface for scanning things. And there's a lot more you can do with it to gain visibility of malicious techniques there now. Um, but obviously, again, all these things attackers adapt. So um, the red team's come along, and I think there's a lot of evidence that people are moving to just using .NET instead now. Because essentially, a lot of the things people were using with PowerShell was really using PowerShell as a mechanism in many cases to use .NET functionality. PowerShell sit, kind of sits on top of .NET, um, and a lot of the improvements to the detection in the detection space for PowerShell are kind of more PowerShell specific rather than .NET specific. Um, so, from a tooling perspective, in quite recent times, there's been a lot of work done here. So. Um, Ghostpack was released fairly recently, um, which has got a, a lot of great tools that are kind of C-sharp versions of things people have become familiar with in offensive PowerShell frameworks. Uh, things like Cobalt Strike have added the ability to dynamically run um, .NET assemblies in other processes uh, to implement, you know, to use this, some of this functionality at runtime. Um, you know, there's people saying that the PowerShell sort of exploitation stuff is dead, and even the, and MWR as well. Our own Red Team has released some of their tools. Um, related to this, so you know, there's a lot of traction, at least in the public security community, around I think moving offensive techniques to .NET. So the question then becomes, from a blue team perspective, like what, how does this change things? And and with regard to this presentation, you know, how does this affect the kind of memory resident execution techniques? Um, I guess first of all, one aspect is why is .NET different? Um, and at least for more modern versions, for a start. We don't necessarily get the same kind of callbacks in terms of um, seeing what we would get from a load library for a DLL normally. Um, if we've got things that are tracking module loads and stuff, we're not necessarily getting the same visibility there. Um, but there are ways of still enumerating what's present in a .NET process in terms of its own assembly. So there is visibility there. It's just a different uh, method that you would use to see that. Um, so the other thing is that .NET provides itself the ability to load assemblies in memory. So where people have gone to effort to write code to do reflective DLL loading for native code and trying to um, implement that in a way that has been something people have seen as, st uh, as stealthy in the past, um, .NET kind of makes this really easy because you can do it just within its own functionality. You can dynamically load an assembly, use reflection, all these things, and you don't have to, you don't have to put your DLL on disk, then um, you can achieve that um, objective of avoiding disk. Um, so there's just an example here of doing it actually using PowerShell, but um, accessing .NET functionality to do this, loading a, a demo assembly in and calling something and printing Hello World. Now there is visibility of this. We can actually enumerate um, the assemblies that are loaded, and if they've been done in memory, we can see this. It's not trivial to then necessarily tie up uh, what the .NET code looks like, from, but at least we can see that in this example, demo assembly is reported and um, we can see it's not image backed. So, you know, in an example on a real system, maybe we'd be paying much closer attention to any assemblies that um, have been loaded in a process without an image backing, so uh, without file backing here. Um, and that's one way, that's one thing that's different about this. So, the other aspect is that even just for the techniques we've looked at before in terms of native um, execution, um, I mentioned the problem of looking for any type of code before and how it was quite false positive prone. This is just like a, I think this was PowerShell, um, that if you look in the process itself, there's lots of areas of perfectly legitimate sections, but that they are in privately allocated regions, they're read, write, execute. So all the kind of things we've got used to as looking at as suspicious indicators, you know, we expect to see legitimately in .NET. And then that makes things hard, because it's like, well, then we have to get very good at trying to identify 
what is malicious code in memory versus what is benign code and being able to separate .NET jitting from, uh, you know, from malicious code that's there. So it kind of muddies the water in terms of um, the approaches that we've taken before, uh, makes things a little bit more tricky. So from some of the work we've done recently, um, we've started using ETW as a, as a way of um, exploring some of this more. And there are some really interesting providers for .NET um, that are really useful. So I'm just going to give a few examples here. Um, We've got two providers, we've got the runtime provider and we've got the rundown provider. The great thing about the rundown provider is it meets our objective of uh, finding pre-existing implants potentially because actually it gives you information about what is already on the system. So you can use it after the fact, you don't necessarily have to be real time when the attack happens. Um, but uh, essentially we can see, for example, here um, we've got the demo assembly that's, uh, that's loaded in the middle, we've got that in the red box. Um, We've seen all the other assembly loads that are going on, um, but we can actually see here that, yes, there was a, um, there's an assembly that's been loaded that doesn't have an image backing. That might be something we want to uh, look into. But assemblies on their own don't tell us much. That's quite a coarse indicator. OK, all right, maybe that's interesting. But what is it? What does it do? Does it look malicious or does it look legitimate? Obviously, this functionality to reflectively load it exists for a reason. Um, so is that OK? Um, but then there are JIT events. So we can actually get events from ETW real time about what happens when a me method is first JITted. So the first time it's executed, the just-in-time compiler compiles it. We then get method level information. So in this case, we can actually see uh, an example of demo assembly um, loading and then actually seeing the constructor called for the class, demo class. And then we can see no names and method being called. Uh, and that gives us a much better idea of actually what's going on. So we won't see that. If that method's called a thousand times, we won't see a thousand events and be flooded for them. We can just see that it's being called at some point because we get the initial JIT event. Um, so if we uh, look at something like um, Metasploit as an example, as one, one example I'm going to use the old uh, PowerShell stager. Um, if we run this uh, using unmanaged PowerShell using a tool called SharpPick, um, essentially then we're avoiding all the normal PowerShell logging. But there's a lot of things in this stager here that are actually, you know, might be suspicious to us. So we can see things being compiled from source. We can see decoding of binary data from from base 64 string, and then in particular, we can see native calls via p invoke going for functions that are commonly um, used by malware, things like virtual arc and uh, and so forth. Um, I and mean, particularly like memory, someone man manually managing memory in .NET is something that we wouldn't normally you know, expect to see. Obviously, .NET would normally cover that for you. So that would be suspicious if someone was using this to stage a native payload. Um, so for example, if we, if we then look at c uh, taking these JIT events uh, into account as well, and we sort of then start building up a list of things we think might be suspicious indicators, actually, we get quite a small amount of output um, that's already relevant here running something like that. So in this case, we actually can see that, OK, the sharp pick program was run. We can see where it's dynamically generated a randomly named uh, assembly and loaded that without a file back in. And then we can see those native calls. Uh, so, so we can see the front basic four string. Then we can see the virtual arc the, and so forth. Um, so we can see that, that looks pretty suspicious. Um, and we've got quite a lot of telemetry that shows us that there. Um, Using another example, I thought to use something much more recent. Uh, Ghostpack came out fairly recently. Ghostpack is a whole suite of tools. So I can do everything, but I just picked one as a good example. And that's something that um, uh, called Safety Cats, which is a way of using Mimikatz to steal passwords, but avoids writing the Mimikatz XE to disk or running it natively, um, or even, uh, and even avoids um, using Mimikatz to access LSAS uh, is process memory directly. So what it does is it takes a mini dump of LSS itself, and then it uses reflective loading techniques via .NET to natively load um, uh, Mimikatz in memory without writing it to disk, and gets it to process the, the memory image it's taken, and then uh, return the results. As a result, seeing it through this lens, we actually see quite a lot of the interesting information there. We can see the mini dump, write dump call that's made. Um, and then we can see you know, a bunch of different other native calls that are made by it that can be particularly suspicious. So um, that's something that's, you know, is pretty interesting there. So finally, with .NET, um, this one thing I did very recently, but 
Um, I started thinking, are, are there other techniques that people might start using here related to .NET uh, that change this? So I started thinking about Gargle, it's a fairly recent technique. We've not really seen it used in the real world apart from home, oh, in red teams, but um, you know, are, is there an equivalent for Gargle uh, for .NET? And I think there is a sort of similar way you can achieve this um, and make things more tricky in the .NET space too. So that there are .NET timers, and you know it's a similar um, case where there's a call, you know there's a callback. So we can set a timer and say, run this code in a minute's time or an hour's time or whatever the case is. Um, so I thought, you know, presumably we should be able to do something similar. Um, the challenge is with this really is that your callback has to match uh, a particular delegate. So that's fine if you want to write your own .NET to do what you want to do. If you want to try and make use purely of existing .NET library functions, then that significantly limits what you can schedule to be called in the future. Um, so like, for example, if we wanted to call assembly.load, um, we'd need that to match, you know, so we can schedule a you know, a loading of a dynamic assembly in the future. We'd need that to match the delegates. That makes things tougher. Um, but if we're willing to write our own code, it's, it's OK. So I think the idea here is that um, there's, a, there's an element of having something that does exist in memory, but keeping that very small and more likely to be seen as, as legit, and keeping your fully featured implant out of sight that's much more obviously malicious if someone looks at it. So. Uh, so the idea here is having something like this. Uh, I mean, this is just some pop code. You, you change it in the real world. But um, we, we can set up a timer and, and get it to fire in future. And then we can have something that can actually dynamically load um, an assembly that's been passed as byte stream, run it in a new app container, and then tear that down afterwards, which cleans it all up. Um, and then we can reschedule that. So you'd need to have some sort of assembly that you load into memory that has this kind of functionality, but maybe you can bury that in a, a, in a bigger assembly that all looks perfectly benign. You've got you know, one function that can load an assembly from a byte stream and something that can schedule that, and then maybe that would pass you know, a casual inspection if someone would go and look at it. And then you have your very obvious uh, <coughs> malicious assembly then not loaded normally. So if you then, you can even then trigger this natively so you can make use of com objects, for example, to um, if you load it and then uh, m make a call that will then pass in your, your, your byte stream for your actual malicious um, implant and have that um, called for this function. So then you get something that looks like um, this. So effectively, we can see our assembly loader in the default domain loaded there. And the idea, that's, that's the thing that we want to make pass a casual inspection and only have a little bit of code that's related to the callbacks. But then, actually, whenever we inspect this at any particular time, if we're using you know, our point in time scanning memory analysis type techniques, we're not going to see the malicious um, assembly loaded. But if you can see from the output before, obviously on a timer, that's getting loaded into a new app domain run and so forth, and then tear down. And we never even see the app domain if we're doing point in time exercises here. So then that's like a gargle type technique for .NET. Um, so it might be that people start moving to using these kind of techniques if, if they're using .NET for more of the tooling as well. So I think that's another challenge um, going forwards. So um, as a conclusion, I mean, I've obviously gone over a lot of different topics there um, quite quickly. Um, but I think the key point for me here is that these techniques, sort of memory resident implants, they've been around for a long time. People are still using them. It really took, I think, the sort of defensive industry a long time to start providing a, a challenge around actually detecting these things in use. Um, but the, you know, the last couple of years, there's been a lot more uh, on this side happening, and people are therefore adapting um, and making stealthier techniques. So there's a couple of aspects to this now, I think. There's really great progress on telemetry that's available to help do this on Windows 10, particularly for the native t techniques we looked at. Um, I think there could be more work for the sort of use case of finding pre-existing implants. So um, any more instrumentation that we can get from the OS, for example, for find, you know, identifying what should be there versus what shouldn't be would make those things a lot uh, easier. So, for example, with .NET, it becomes very complicated to analyze that space and find 
separate the, um, the legitimate code from the pot potentially malicious code. Anything that sort of fits in there is going to be really valuable in future in pushing these techniques. Um, but otherwise, I mean, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more um, evasion techniques being used in this space now that uh, memory analysis techniques and sort of code injection tracing me methods and EDR tooling and so forth has become a lot more commonplace and we'll probably see a lot more evolution in this um, go forwards. So that concludes my presentation. So at this point, uh, so there any questions? Great talk, thanks. Um, do you have a blog or anything with some suggestions on some specific events that you'd like to see in Windows or .NET or anything like that? Um, I haven't, uh, yeah, we haven't put anything specific like that, but I'd, lo I'd love to have conversations with people about it. Um, we've got, there's lots of stuff on our blog from, you know, for the, so, some of these techniques and some of the content in this presentation has been gone over, but um, from what I'd like to see, uh, I just, yeah, I think I'd love to have a conversation. Hey, uh, great presentation. Um, I specifically like to know what are your thoughts on things like recently happening in Cactus Torch malware, where they make use of uh, .NET to JS, where they compile a assembly into the JavaScript and then making use of uh, all the com common OLE APIs in the JavaScript. They just execute the JavaScript, which is nothing like a malicious DLL for assembly. How could we go about detecting those kind of, uh, you know, stealthy, fileless, living on the land attacks. So are you, are you talking about, just to clarify, .NET to JS, the tool? Yes, .NET to JS, which has been recently yeah. used in Cactus Torch. Uh, I'd need to go and have a look at that again, but I think, I'm pretty sure that some of the ETW approaches I looked at there would give instrumentation into that, and so you would, you'd be able to see that um, there is essentially uh, some .NET compilation stuff going on um, after the fact, um, I would need to double check on that, but I suspect that the ETW providers would give some insight to that, but I haven't tried it yet. All right, well, uh, thank you again, Luke. Please give another round of applause. Thank you.